Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so uh, what we are going to do today is um, we are going to apply the four year transformation that we saw last time on different types of signals that we can see in the real life. So, if you recall, uh, the way we define the Fourier transformation matrix, the G matrix, is by this complex exponential function, right? It is the argument has square root of minus one, so that is how it becomes complex exponential, and it can be written as cosine and sine, uh, where sine is multiplied by square root of minus one. Each column of this G matrix is a unique complex exponential oscillating at certain frequency. And that frequency parameter is this K parameter. And uh, in this case, I have made this K vary from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, okay? So that is how I'm going to define a normalized frequency. So each column of this G matrix is at a different value of K and all values of time sample N and N goes from zero to N minus one. That is how we define this G matrix. And if you recall, last time we saw that this G matrix has orthogonal columns. All of these complex exponentials uh, for different values of K, they become orthogonal. They become 90 degrees with respect to each other. And here, this is a 64 dimensional matrix, meaning that we are defining not a two dimensional plane or a three dimensional uh, space. It's a 64 dimensional entity. You can still call it a space. It's called actually hyperspace but it is nothing that our brains can visualize. It has 64 dimensions. It has 64 axes which are perpendicular to each other. Um, and those axes, those 64 dimensions are nothing but the columns of this G matrix. So this is what we saw last time. Okay, so let me uh, run this particular section. And uh, now I have this G matrix defined in my MATLAB. Uh, code. Now I'm going to start analyzing different types of signals, right? So one type of signal that is very, you know, easy to understand is a signal with constant value. That is what I have defined this very first signal. It is made up of all ones. Uh, and so it's the time domain version of a DC signal. Uh, if I put zeros at the beginning and zeros at the end, then it will look like a rectangular pulse. But right now I'm not doing that. I'm just putting all ones. So what is the frequency of the signal? Can somebody tell me? For a DC signal, what is its frequency? What What is the frequency? Yeah, it is zero hertz, right? So it is a signal at zero hertz. So what do you expect when I do this analysis of this DC signal? Remember, I am when I do this analysis, I am checking out of all of these frequencies, which frequencies are present and at what strength. So, what do you expect here? Constant G. Uh, can you repeat? We have to, we got only cos component. Right. I, I, I'm doing this uh, analysis, the discrete Fourier transform. And we, you already told me that uh, this signal has only one frequency present, which is zero hertz. 
So when I dissect this signal and I, I'm trying to see which frequencies are present, what will I see? Sir, a big spike at zero frequency and then a constant to zero. Exactly, exactly. So I, I should see a big spike at zero hertz and then or everywhere else I should see zero. Now, what is typical in uh, showing or in uh, plotting or in visualizing the output of Fourier transform? See, Fourier transform is generally a complex number. Because when I do the Fourier transformation, uh, the result will have both the magnitude and the phase. Now, it's not easy to plot complex numbers, but there are two ways. One is either you plot the real component and the imaginary component. The other is that you plot the magnitude, which is taken by the absolute function of the MATLAB in one plot, and then you plot the phase angle, which is by this function, angle function. Of one other thing is that the magnitude typically we plot in the decibel scale, not in the absolute scale. I mean, there's nothing wrong if you plot just in absolute, but in decibel scale, you know, it uh, is the standard uh, way of plotting the magnitude. So I converted, uh, I took the magnitude here, and then I converted it to decibel scale, which is obtained by taking logarithm and multiplying by 20. So magnitude is in the decibel scale. Now, uh, what is log 10 of 0? Minus infinity. Minus infinity. It is going to be minus infinity. So what you are going to see in this plot, instead of 0, you will see some numbers which are very small in dB scale. Okay. So let us run this uh, section. And this is how it's looking like. Right, so this is the signal that I have generated. It's a constant signal. It's a DC signal all once, 64 once, because N is equal to 64. And if I look at its Fourier transformation, the magnitude, remember it, this is in decibel scale. So magnitude has only one non-zero entry uh, and its value is going to be around close to 18 dB because uh, there are 64 ones and it's going to add up all the 64 values. And so uh, it's going to get in absolute scale, an answer which is 64. Like if you take 10 log of 64, you get 18. So at zero hertz, remember this is the frequency axis. So at zero frequency, I get a spike, like what Hirsch had said. And at all other values, I get some numbers which are very small. MATLAB can't do negative infinity, but negative 300 is pretty small number in db and so this is the expected answer this is what we would expect and then there is this phase part also but uh, the only thing that matters is the value at zero which is zero everything else is bogus because the magnitude is already nulled out it is zeroed out so then the phase doesn't matter you know if in the complex number plane, if you are already at the origin, then it's not possible to define the phase. And so MATLAB just pumps out some random values, which don't matter. Okay, so, so that is the first signal. Now, the second experiment that I'm going to do now is uh, Instead of uh, the DC signal, I'm going to generate a triangular signal. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, let us see what it looks like. Okay, so I, I, I'll just plot it here. So this is the triangular shape signal. And you can see that now it will have some non-zero frequencies also because it is changing with time. The time sample and its values are changing. And so you would expect that it will start exhibiting some, it will, it will be comprised of, it will uh, be consisting of frequencies uh, other than zero frequency. I mean, it will have zero, but also other frequencies. But you will see that this is a real valued signal because I'm not putting any complex number here. This is all real. And that is the property that I had asked you in the Viva or in the poll that we just now did. That uh, the second property of Fourier transform is that for a signal which is real valued, its Fourier transform is complex conjugate symmetry in the frequency axis. So what what does me, what does it mean to say it is complex conjugate symmetric? If I take the magnitude of the DFT, it should be perfectly symmetric. But the complex conjugation symmetry will appear in the phase. If I take the phase, they will be exactly negative of each other at opposite frequencies. So that is what we see here. The magnitude around zero is perfectly symmetric. It's like mirror image. The values start becoming very small as I move away from zero hertz. So still most of the energy in triangular signal is concentrated around zero. It, these are very small frequencies which are away from zero. And as I move away, start going away from zero, the magnitude starts becoming very small. And I haven't plotted magnitudes which are less than negative 20 dB because they are anyhow very suppressed. Compared to this peak value, which is 30 dB, this is like already 50 dB below that. 50 dB in decibel scale is a lot in the absolute scale. Okay, so it's like 10 to the power minus 5. So compared to this value, the frequency at around negative 0.18, and positive 0.18, is 10 to the power minus five times smaller. So it's pretty much not there in F anymore. You can see that most of these uh, frequencies which are present are very close to zero. But the this picture demonstrates the second property of Fourier transform that the magnitude is symmetric around zero hertz and phase is asymmetric. You see, this is zero, around zero positive and negative frequencies are exactly negative with each other. You see, it's, it's, it, it is exhibiting mirror symmetry, but uh, in the negative sense. You take all the phase values on the positive frequency axis, you multiply them by minus one and you get simply the negative frequency phase values. So that is the complex conjugation symmetry. It appears only in the phase. Or other way to say that is that it appears only in the imaginary part of the complex number. The real part is completely symmetric. The imaginary part is negative symmetry. Or equivalently, the, fa uh, the magnitude is symmetric phase is negative symmetry, right? So this is how uh, we have analyzed the triangular signal. This is how it looks like. If suppose somebody makes a very fancy type of prism, which instead of passing the white light through and showing all the different colors at the output, 
if somebody takes this triangular signal and passes it through this uh, strange type of prism, the output of the prism will have this, this values. Okay, so that is what the Fourier transformation does. Now, the other thing is that I can take this Fourier transformation output on line 24 and I just multiply it by G. So, I, I take G times this SFDFT. If I do that, what will I be, what will I be doing? Signal back. Signal itself. What is it called? Synthesis, sir. Exactly. I will be synthesizing the actual signal, actual time domain signal, the triangular signal. I'll be synthesizing it. And the way I will synthesize is it by adding up the columns of G. I'll be doing linear superposition, linear combination of the columns of G. And in that linear addition, in that uh, summation, this S of F D F T, this values here that I'm plotting are going to specify the weighting components, which frequency I'm going to add up by what amount. It's like mixing the colors now. Here I am looking at the composite signal and trying to figure out what all colors it is made up of. If I do G times this SFDFT, then I'm kind of combining all the colors in different proportions, in different weights. That is called the synthesis. And the other way is to say that it is the transfer. The name might seem fancy, but inverse Fourier transform is nothing but synthesizing the time domain signal. And if I do that, if I pass this SFDFT through that synthesis operation, magically I've got, I'll get back this triangular signal. Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay, now uh, in the remaining two or so lectures that we have left in this semester, I, I'll be focusing mostly on the Fourier transformation, but you will be actually studying a lot more Fourier transform in the next semester when you take signals in systems. Okay. Now, there are two ways to look at signals in systems course. Two ways to, to think about it. Two ways to kind of approach it or have your mental attitude. One is that it's a math heavy course. And if you take it as math heavy, a lot of you, maybe a majority of you will kind of feel, oh my God, I, I don't like too much math. And so you will be turned off. You, you will not be having the right mindset to appreciate signals and systems. That is one way. The other way is to, one is what I have told earlier that uh, you can think of signals and systems as a way, a course which is going to help you understand how your own brain functions. You know, we have said that when we listen to somebody speaking or we listen to a music, piece of music, our brain is doing Fourier analysis. When we speak, our auditory uh, bodily components, our throat and our uh, swarpeti, auditory box, it is doing Fourier synthesis. Same thing applies to our vision and so on. So one way is to think of like that. The other way, I, can, I, I want to kind of incentivize you to think of this Fourier transformation topic and signals and systems in general is to think of it as a who done it. Okay. Do you know what who done it means? It's it's spelled as Called, it's a type of a novel. 
food and its knowledge. Does anyone know? Has anybody come across this word? No. Okay. So it's a <laughs> slang. It's a shortened form of who has done it. So that is uh, the meaning of this who done it means. Who has done it? It meaning murder. So, who has done the murder? What are the novels in which that question becomes the main question? These are the murder mysteries or in general mysteries. Maybe it is not murder. Maybe it is a theft. Maybe it is some other crime. But the mysteries are the central theme of such novels. And so, if you are into reading, you would have read uh, this type of mystery novels. And you know, what happens is at certain point, you can't put the book down. It is, that is what happens with me. Once I start reading a novel, it's a mystery novel, suspense. Uh, and if it is well written, if it is a good book, then after I reach maybe third or fourth chapter, or sometimes I have to go up to maybe 10th or 15th chapter, then it becomes so engrossing that I have to finish it. I forget about taking my lunch or dinner or things like that. It becomes highly, like you get absorbed in it. So that is how you want to take this Fourier transformation topic and signals and systems course in general. It's a mystery course. There are so many mysteries. There are so many nice suspense that you discover throughout the course. And the, the way you discover, you know, just like the detective uses forensic equipments, here we are using math. So don't think of math as something that you are not comfortable with. The math is going to help you discover the mysteries. Don't focus on the math, focus on the mystery, the, the, the amazing things that become known to you, the type of concepts that make you say, wow, I didn't know that. It's pretty cool, pretty nice, pretty interesting. If you keep your eyes focused on that, that then a lot of the math abstraction, it will just become like forensic too. It won't be in your way. Okay, so one such mystery of the Fourier transformation is that there is a duality aspect to it, okay? So duality is again a fancy word. All that it means is that I can interchange the X axis of these two plots. So what do I mean by that? What I say is that in this plot, this is obviously the time domain because I'm plotting this triangular signal, which is a function of time sample n. And then this is clearly the frequency domain. I'm plotting the output of the analysis or the Fourier transformation, and that I'm obtaining as function of frequency f. The duality property, which is one of the most interesting properties of Fourier transform, and it gives you a lot of leverage. You know, you can, once you get the concept underlying duality, you can pull a lot of levers. You have a lot of skills at that point. The duality property says is that I can make this to be the time domain signal. So my time domain signal now is complex valued and its magnitude looks like this. And its phase looks like this, right? There is nothing that prevents me to make up in MATLAB a time, time domain signal whose magnitude is this and the phase is this. You'll ask me, how do I make up such a signal? Well, I have already made it up here on line 24. These values that are in the 64 cross one vector, I will interpret them as belonging to the time domain. 
all these values are function of index n. What happens is if I now take this time domain signal and if I analyze it, if I want to figure out what frequency components are present, I don't have to look much further. This is how the analysis output will look like. The analysis will have this type of shape. This particular frequency component is going to be the strongest and all the other frequency components will be decreasing in the magnitude. The overall shape will be triangle. So you can kind of go back and forth from the time and frequency domains. So that is enough said. Now I will analyze two more different signals. One is called the sync pulse. So let us see what that pulse looks like. It's a wavy pulse, but the wave aspect of it kind of tapers down as you move away from uh, the center. And so the sync pulse looks like this. It's, 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 it is having a wave, like a sinusoidal wave, but the wave is tapering down. In fact, it, the sync is also a mathematical function. It goes on until plus minus infinity. The waves never become zero, but beyond certain uh, point, they pretty much become zero because, you know, right now they are already down to less than 0.1 in the value. And I haven't gone beyond 30 samples. If I go to 300 sample, this wave will be like 0 0.001 or something like that. So if I analyze it, this is how it looks like. Again, you will see that there is a mirror image symmetry in the magnitude and negative symmetry in the phase, which is expected because it's a real valued signal. Can anybody tell me what this magnitude function looks like? What does it remind you of? Ignore a little bit of imperfection, but overall, the, does this shape remind you of something? Rectangular points. Exactly, Kandarp. So it, it's like a rectangle. Uh, all these values, you can think of them as pretty much zeros because they are so much below the peak. So it's all zeros up to this in the absolute scale, not in dB. In dB, they are all negative infinity. So negative infinity up to maybe around 0.1, and then it certainly shoots up. And then it becomes nearly a constant around 15, 15 dB. And then around 0.1, it again becomes negative infinity or zero. So the magnitude is like a rectangle. And the phase is symmetric. So from this and, and applying the duality property, can anybody tell me what will be the, if I, if I think of a rectangle, pulse, rectangular pulse in the time domain, and if I analyze it, what will its spectrum look like? Well, what will its frequency composition be like? The duality property says that a rectangular pulse will have frequency composition, which is like this. Okay. So, so that is one more example of analysis and synthesis. And then the last example is also a wavy pulse, but it's slightly different. It kind of tapers off faster than the sink. Uh, and it's called raise cosine pulse. Actually, it's called square root raise cosine. And I, the way I generate it is by using this uh, inbuilt function of MATLAB. It's called raise cosine uh, design function. Now I have to specify some parameters which we don't need to worry about. And I have to specify whether I want the square root or not. So right now I'm going to do the square root 
uh, part of it. So it's going to give me the square root raised to sine pulse. So let us see how that one looks like. So you see, it's also a wavy pulse, a lot like sync, but now it, you see it tapers off faster. It already became very, very small by the time we reach about 60 samples, uh, by the time we reach about 30 samples on the either side of middle. And it's Fourier transform kind of looks little better version of the rectangle. The top part is almost a constant. Phase is still symmetric, as you can see. Okay. So that is uh, just to give you kind of uh, an idea of the different types of uh, time domain signal that we can kind of pass them through this prison of Fourier transformation, which is nothing but our G matrix that we have studied in the up conversion, down conversion uh, concept of modulation. Here we are kind of really generalizing that concept of analysis and synthesis of having a, a matrix which has orthogonal columns or a matrix whose inverse is nothing but its transpose. So that is what the Fourier transform is in, in a nutshell. In the next week, uh, it's the uh, penultimate week of this semester. We will not have any new lab, but I'm going to just give you this uh, BFT MATLAB code that I have written for th this code and the code that we did in the previous lecture. And you don't have to submit any, uh, well, Maybe we will also, I mean, you will be asked to submit your lab report, but you don't have to write any code as such. All you do is just experiment with this. You can change the values of N. You can change the type of signals that you want to analyze. You can also experiment with this duality part, which I told you. You, you generate a signal, look at its uh, Fourier transform, and then for duality, you think of that Fourier transform itself as a time domain signal and analyze it back and see whether you get the original signal back or not in the frequency domain. So I, all, all such experiment, you, you do it on, on top of this uh, MATLAB file that I will share with you. Don't just limit to this uh, three or four signals that I have examined here, you can come up with your own signal, whichever signal you want to examine. You put it under this uh, prism of Fourier transformation and you see what its frequency spectrum is looking like. So, so just get your uh, feet wet and your hand dirty with this uh, Fourier analysis and Fourier synthesis. Okay, so that is going to be your last lab. It's going to be open-ended, uh, not much of programming at all, but a lot more experimentation, a way for you to become familiar with what Fourier transformation is all about. Okay, so, so that is the first part, what I wanted to show to you today. Now we will go to the actual lecture. Uh, but before that, I'm going to take a brief uh, break and I'll Okay. So let us start um, or rather resume, so to speak. Um, I'm going to now focus on this topic of Fourier transformation that we have already kind of seen a preview of, oh, sorry, this is a typo. So, um, you might wonder why are we doing this Fourier transformation at this point? 
so there are two reasons. One is that, you know, we have kind of made use of Fourier transformation already when we studied the frequency of conversion. And there we especially relied on those two properties of Fourier transformation, the modulation theorem and the complex conjugation property. Uh, and it's, let's see whether we can appreciate those properties in a more fundamental manner. At that time, I said that you just take my word for it. But uh, let us see if we can kind of see why those properties, why those theorems have to be true. So that is one reason why we are spending uh, the last few lectures on Fourier transformation. The other reason is that although we took the simplified model, remember the model with just the constellation points of the modulation. And then we actually added this other component to it, which is frequency up conversion and down conversion. This result that we have now with uh, the frequency up conversion, down conversion, the part which you are working on in uh, this week's lab, it is still not complete. Okay, it, there is still some few things more that uh, we need to do to that model to make it a, a real, real model, a, a realistic model model which actually is very close to how the modem today in your cell phone or in your set-top box gets simplified. And so to be able to understand that additional component of the modulation and demodulation, Fourier transformation and the topic that we are going to study today, it is absolutely necessary. We can't get around uh, this topic. And so uh, that is the reason why we are looking at this topic of Fourier transformation. It will connect us back to the modulation and demodulation topic. The first thing that I'm going to do today, and maybe the only thing given that we have maybe only about half an hour left, is nothing like Fourier transform. Okay, it is a brand new topic a brand new concept, uh, and that concept is called uh, the concept of convolution, okay? So, we, as you know, we have done this source coding, channel coding, and we have done modulation, uh, but maybe a few more aspects of modulation is what we are going to do today, and that uh, requires us to first get our arms around this topic of convolution. The convolution operation is needed to understand not only the modulation and demodulation, but also the channel. What the communication channel, realistic communication channels do. Uh, in a way, they kind of do the convolution. And the convolution is sometimes used even for channel coding also. There is a type of con uh, channel code which is known as convolution code. We have not studied that in, in this semester. Uh, in fact, in the previous year, your one year senior batch, they studied this convolution code in detail and they did their project on convolution coding. So what is that convolution operation? That is the topic of, of the remaining half an hour. Now, most of you, maybe all of you have never actually come across the convolution operation mathematically. But moving forward, this is going to be a, a very key concept for you to get your arms around. It is very simple math, math formula. There is nothing uh, very complicated about it, but it, it appears in so many different domains. It's like one of the foundations. It, it forms kind of a foundational stone. It appears in definitely in communication theory, in signal processing, in signals and systems, but it also appears 
fundamentally in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, in big data analysis, in uh, a lot of the algorithmic aspects of computer science. Later on, you're going to study a course on analysis uh, and design of algorithms. That is a purely a computer science course, but the convolution operation will be there in, in at least few algorithms that you will study. So it's a very, uh, you can almost think of convolution as addition and uh, multiplication. You know, these are very basic functions and you, you can't get away from them. The convolution is like that. And in a way, it is actually thought of as a generalized multiplication. Okay, it doesn't look like multiplication, uh, but it kind of is generalized way of thinking about multiplication. And so it has this symbol, star symbol, which we sometimes use to denote multiplication. And so convolution is defined over some sequences. In this case, I'm calling them to be a time domain sig signal. Uh, this index n, you can think of them as currently as time domain index n. So I have two time domain sequences, which I'm calling x of n and h of n. Uh, they can be any, any time domain sequence. And in fact, they don't even have to be time domain. Uh, this x of n can be your one column of Excel. H of n can be another column of Excel. And they have some numbers inside each column. And n just denotes the index of the row of the spreadsheet. Then this convolution operation of these two uh, sequences, or even these two, you can think of them as vectors, is defined like this. Okay? This is the definition of convolution operation. That, that, that is all there is to it. It has some uh, dummy variable k, and k goes from minus infinity to infinity. In general, this x and h might be infinite sequences or infinite uh, domain signals. So therefore, k has to go from minus infinity to infinity. Or typical x and h, which are finite, uh, we don't have to sum over minus infinity to infinity, we just sum over the values which are known zeros. The point is that k is a dummy variable, and we are summing over that dummy variable for a specific value of n. And that will give us the output value of the convolution for that value of n. Right? And in this formula, I can interchange X and H. And then I get this formula. And it will give me the same answer. And uh, this, as I said, it can be applied to channel coding where the values are binary. Or it can be applied to your Excel spreadsheets where the values may be decimal or it can be applied to machine learning problems where they may be real or complex numbers. And X and H may not need to have, uh, they do not need to have equal length. And uh, that is how the convolution looks like. Now, although it is entirely optional, we don't need to think of convolution operation in this particular way. Uh, one way to think about X on H is that X is an input and H defines the system. And the output is the convolution of the input with the system. Specifically, we will see later on that H is what is known as the impulse response of the system. So we'll, I'll write it here, uh, but you don't need to worry about what that impulse response means and all that. So 
system equals expense. So, uh, so that is one way to think of the convolution equation. And the system viewpoint is going to be useful to us later on. Okay, so so let us uh, now actually work with some example okay so i'm going to take some example x and h uh, and to keep things simple i'm going to just make them very short sequences so this both have only three samples and i'm going to assume that uh, this one here is for n equal to zero and therefore this will be n equal to two same way this is n equal to 0, and this will be n equal to 2. And so I'm going to do the actual uh, evaluation. So the way I will do the evaluation is uh, I will first draw x and h. So this is x. This is H, and I'm going to draw them as a function of this K variable. Remember the dummy variable? So I just need to do uh, K equal to 0, K equal to 1, and K equal to 2. And same way here for H as well. Uh, but for H, I'm going to even include k equal to minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. Okay. So, x looks like this half triangular shape, right? Its first value is 1, second value is 2, and the third is 3. Right, 1, 2, 3 at 0, 1, and 2. Now, edge looks like uh, flat in the beginning and then it shoots up. Uh, so, I will not draw it right now, but uh, I will write down the equation of convolution for y equal to 0. So y equal to 0 is going to be, and this I'm going to write here, um, is going to be x of k times h of minus k. Why is that? Because if I plug in this equation n equal to 0, then you see it becomes x of k times h of minus k. Right? Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yes. So y equal to 0 is just this formula. So what happens when I do this h of n? First of all, I make n equal to k, and then I make it minus k. It, all that happens is h becomes flipped around 0. And that's why I put these values of k, minus 2 and minus 1. So minus 0 of 0 is still 0. And so h of 0 is going to be 1. So, so h of 0 is same. But h of minus 1 is going to be equal to h of 1. And so h of minus 1 is going to be 1 also. And the h of minus 2 is going to be 3. So this is how h of minus k looks like. This is actually 
uh, edge of minus two. And this is x of k. Is it fine now? So if I take the product and then sum them up, what I'm going to get, who can tell me? Remember X values for minus two and minus one are all zeros. X starts with K equal to zero. So if I take X of K and multiply by H of minus K, what will I get? I'll be doing three times zero, so I'll get zero. Here I'll be doing one times zero. And so again, I'm going to get zero. So if I write it down, it's going to be zero plus zero. The third entry is going to be one because I'll take one and multiply it with this one. So I'll get plus one. And then the remaining two entries are going to be zero because uh, two and three are getting multiplied by zero. So I'll get, this is that summation it looks like. And so the answer I get is one. Right? I'll do one more example. Maybe I'll uh, open up a new slide. Sir, here we are setting k from minus two, right? Sorry. Uh, here we are setting k from minus two, right? Yeah, because h of n is from zero, one, and two, n equal to zero, n equal to two. So h of minus k will start from minus two. Beyond minus two, it will not have any values. Okay. Basically, all that I did was this one one three. I flipped it around because I'm doing minus k. It's the values we have that we are not defined. We will take them as zero by default. Yeah. Okay, so let us do one more calculation. So again, I'll draw. Uh, Again, I will draw this K axis. And I'll do minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two. And uh, remember in this formula, I don't have to change X of K at all. X of K is always there. It's this H which keeps on changing for different values of N. Right now we did it for N equal to zero. Now we will do it for N equal to one. So this is the calculation for N equal to zero. Now we will do it for N equal to one. And now I'm going to define the same K values here for X. So this is going to be X of K and for H, what do I need to do now? I can't do H of minus K anymore. I want to now evaluate Y of one. So the formula for Y of one is going to be summation over K, X of K, what should I write for H? H of one minus K. One minus K. Minus k. One minus h k. of h of one minus k yes so x i can still define in the same way as before this is one two and three but now i have to see what this h of one minus k looks like okay so what i'm going to do is uh Take the specific values. Okay, so 
if I take k equal to minus 2, what will be 1 minus k? 0. 3. 3. 3. Yeah, minus k is 3. Is h defined for 3? No, sir. No, sir. Oh. H is not defined for 3, so I have to put 0 here. Okay, what about if I take k equal to minus 1? What will be 1 minus k? H of 2. 2. H of 2. 2. What is, what is H of 2? 3. 3. 3. It's 3. Three. But the plot will shift 1 unit rightwards. And so, likewise, you can say that H of 0 is going to be, sorry, for k equal to 0, H of 1 minus k is going to be H of 1, which is 1. And then uh, for k equal to 1, h of 1 minus k is the same as h of 0. And so I get 1, 1. So what happened is like what somebody just now said, I took this h of minus k and I shifted it rightward by one unit. And that one unit is nothing but my n variable in that equation. So now if I do multiplication, the first one is going to be zero. Second one is going to be what? You can tell me the second value. One. One, sir. No, Vivek, I'm, I'm doing H of one minus K, which is three times X of K. But x of minus 1 is 0. 0. So second is also going to be 0. And then the third one is going to be 1. Fourth one is going to be 2. two. And then fifth is going to be 0. zero. And so the answer is going to be 3. Right. So similarly, you can plug in n equal to two, n equal to three, and you will you will get the answers. I hope that you understood what you have to do. When you want to calculate y of two, all you do is you take this h of minus k and you slide it one more toward the right. And so I I won't actually plot it here, but y of two will look like what? If I slide it one more unit to the right, then the first value will be zero, second will be zero, the third value will be what? Three. 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 Then? One. Two, sir. Two, two. 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 And, and then? Again, three. 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 And, and now, actually, I will have to put few more zeros. I actually, as I keep on going to higher values of y, I will have to start using values of k which are beyond 3 or beyond 2. Right now not, but uh, eventually I will have to do that. And so this value turns out to be 8. Anyways, uh, so this is what uh, all there is to the convolution, okay? Um, now, Let me uh, tell you that, you know, a, a number such as any, any number that you can think of, it can be thought of as a sequence. Like 123 can be thought of as a sequence, one, two, and three. Although the convolution operation may be unknown to you the way we have written it, the, the way we have formulated it, it turns out that when you were in your elementary school, just coming out of kindergarten, and when you were taught how to multiply two numbers, 
unknown to you, you were already doing convolution. So that is how prevalent convolution is. That is why convolution is called a generalized multiplier. Okay, so we will end today's lecture by looking at one more MATLAB. Okay, you're going to you're looking at my screen. Yes. Are you able to see this MATLAB screen? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the example that we were just now looking at. I have X, which is 123, and I made it to be a sequence. And H is another sequence, 113. The same example that we were doing by hand just now. Now there is no need to do it by hand. MATLAB has an inbuilt function called convolution function that you can directly use. But before you use the function, you need to know what the convolution is doing. And so that is what the purpose of the hand exercise we did just now was. Sometimes it is Good if you write this convolution function yourself. So you, it's like your own developed function, and so you exactly know what you are doing. Uh, but it is okay to use this inbuilt function also. So this convolution function uh, I'm going to use to convolve this x and h, and then to show to you what I just said that this second grade or third grade grade math that you did where you multiplied these two numbers 123 and 113 they will give you both the same answers remember we got one three and eight we didn't do the remaining two values but if we did it would have turned out to be nine nine so convolution of one two three and one one three is one three eight nine nine and if you multiply these two numbers, look what you get. Right? So, so that is what it is. In case if signals and systems or Fourier transformation looks tough to you, the origins are what you studied when you were like seven years old. This is another example. Here I am multiplying two numbers, 1,221 with 2,110. And you will again see that the result of convolution and the actual product are the same. So the last thing for today is one, uh, one thing I want to mention that there is one caveat that I want to keep, I want you to keep in mind, which is that, which is this last bullet of the slide that. In general, if you plug in two numbers and make them sequences like the way, way I have done it here. Uh, by the way, are you able to see my screen? No, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Anyways, uh, I think I was having some technical difficulty. So, uh, one thing you have to keep in mind that uh, there is some carry forward digits that uh, happen in in multiplication the way we do it on a piece of paper using our hands that 
concept of carry o, carry forward is not there in convolution. And so therefore, purposefully, I had selected these two numbers where the carry forward problem is not there. But that is a detail. The underlying method is the method of convolution. Okay, so that is one thing that I wanted to mention to you. Okay, so I will... Uh,